you guys are great. Thank you. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, all three in the afternoon, not at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate, called Beautiful, where he was put every day to bed in those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, met with John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in a place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him up from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you. Even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you, and anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Though your offspring, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Well, good evening. Uh, let me add my welcome to Rhiannon's, um, including to those uh, watching online. Uh, we're continuing in our series in Acts, as um, she introduced at the start. And so uh, we reach this passage in Acts 3 tonight. So let me pray that God will uh, help us as we look at a passage which really confronts us in terms of our response uh, to the risen Lord Jesus. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can freely gather together tonight. Uh, We thank you for the gift of your word, uh, which we can so often take for granted, but we thank you that we have it in our own language, that we can therefore hear your voice as we read it, and your spirit applies it to our hearts and minds. And we ask that you would do that tonight, that we might understand more of your plans for us and this world of yours, uh, that we might hear your word clearly and respond rightly to your son that you've given to us. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. Well, we're used to observing, aren't we, uh, master craftsmen who pass on their skill to apprentices that are under them. And so the apprentice learns their craft from the master, seeking to emulate the way that they do things. I can remember a number of years ago now, uh, we had the opportunity to see a master glass blower in Venice making these amazing 
glass sculptures. And at the same time, as we got to see that, we were watching uh, an apprentice that was keenly watching him and observing all that he was doing. And then we got to see the apprentice uh, follow his steps, copying everything that he had seen, determined to get it just right, to imitate his master completely. Well, there's something of that going on in the book of Acts as we see the disciples of Jesus wanting to imitate their master, Jesus, who has now ascended to heaven. When Jesus commenced his earthly ministry, uh, in Luke 4, speaking at the synagogue, he took out the scroll of Isaiah, unrolled it to Isaiah 61, and proclaimed the following, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. This was his mission. And there's a strong sense in the book of Acts as the fledgling church commences uh, that the apostles will continue the work of their master Jesus. Or rather, the risen Lord Jesus will continue his work through his followers. You see, soon after this announcement by Jesus that this is what his public ministry was about, he then healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law, um, a whole bunch of people flocked to her house in the aftermath and he healed them of all kinds of illnesses. This is in Luke 4, straight after his announcement at the synagogue. Then the following chapter in Luke 5, he heals a lame man, which we'll see tonight in Acts 3. And then by, Acts, uh, by Luke chapter 9, he is sending out his 12 disciples with the power and authority to cure all kinds of diseases and they go out on a temporary mission um, and do just that. And so it shouldn't really surprise us that when we get to the end of Acts chapter 2, the passage we looked at last week, that suddenly we see a description amongst this new church community that includes the statement, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And so as we commence chapter 3 today, we're suddenly given an example of one of those many signs and wonders as Peter and John go up to the temple to pray in the afternoon. Now, notice that we're told about this man who was lame from birth, and we learn in next week's chapter, chapter 4, uh, that he was over 40 years old at this point. And so he would have been a very well-known character. We're told that he's regularly placed by his friends and family at the Gate Beautiful, which was one of the entrances, the eastern entrance to the temple courts. So people would be seeing him day after day, week after week, year after year. He would have been recognised by everyone. And he sits there, as uh, a beggars do, and we might see them even in today's context at times, asking for money for the crowd that's passing by, entering into the temple courts for the afternoon prayer at three o'clock. But suddenly Peter and John sort of stop him because he's just been placed there and he's asking without even looking at them, and they ask for his attention. And so he gives it to them and he must be expecting that they're going to give him some money because otherwise they just would have gone past without saying anything. But he's disappointed because suddenly they announce, well, we have no money to give you. And I guess as the disappointment is rising, suddenly Peter puts out his hand, but he says, but what I do have I give you, rise up and walk. And he takes him by the hand and miraculously his feet and ankles are strengthened. And for the first time in his life, this man stands up and is then able to walk into the temple courts with Peter and John, something he has not done in his whole life. Incredible scene. And of course, it draws attention. He's so well known. And so as he's going in, there is this amazing scene. It's not like he's limping in, still struggling, or he's sort of playing down what has happened to him. No, this guy's jumping and leaping around, praising God for this amazing miracle that has taken place. And in fact, it's a great fulfillment of what the prophet Isaiah said would happen when the Messiah came. Isaiah 35 verse 6 uh, is a passage which talks about the lame leaping like a deer. And here is a man who had been lame since birth for over 40 years, and here he is leaping and praising God as he enters the temple courts. And so it's no wonder then from verse 10 and 11 that lots of people are being drawn to what's happened. He's such a recognised figure. And so they realise he's this guy that they've been passing all the time. How is it that he's walking around? And he's clinging on to Peter and John, which makes it clear that 
Well, they are the reason that he is able to walk like this. And so suddenly there's not only a crowd being drawn together, but they're actually running towards Peter and John and this man. And they reach them in this location called Solomon's Colonnade. That was a long porch down the whole eastern wall of the temple. There's uh, columns all the way down, a cedar roof over the top. And it was often a place on this outer edge of the courts that people would teach. Jesus himself had taught at this very location in John chapter 10. And so a huge crowd starts to mull around them, mill around them at this point. And we get this feeling, hopefully, at this point in the passage that this is a repeat. This is like Acts chapter 2. A miraculous thing happens. A huge crowd is drawn together and Peter doesn't miss his moment. And so he seizes the day again and steps up in verse 12 to preach the gospel, to announce what is happening and speak about Jesus. You notice as Peter steps up to speak, he plays down the miracle. It's not really about the miracle. It's certainly not about his involvement in it. It just gives him a reason to point to Jesus and to explain something even more crucial. And so the big question that I want us to consider is the question that really Peter is putting to the crowd with what he says. And it's about response to Jesus. How are we to respond to the risen Jesus? What are we being called to do? How are we to respond to Jesus from what Peter is about to announce? Well, three answers to that question tonight first answer is this by accepting our guilt by accepting our guilt notice where peter starts perhaps strangely to the crowd that's rushed to see this miraculously healed man verse 13 the god of abraham isaac and jacob the god of our fathers has glorified his servant jesus you handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. Well, notice, firstly, Peter briefly starts with some common ground, speaking of the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That they're all in agreement on. Even though he's then going to turn to a focus on Jesus, the Messiah, who they've missed. But nevertheless, he's saying, even as he announces that this is all in continuity with the Old Testament, that there's no new thing here. This is actually a fulfillment of what has always been promised through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is at work in a new way, fulfilling what he's promised. And so notice, secondly then, he says that God the Father has honoured Jesus. He talks about him being glorified. But in sharp contrast, he's then going to get into the gist of his first main point, And that is that all the crowd that are assembled there have dishonoured Jesus. And so did you notice how confronting Peter's statements are to the crowd here? I mean, they've rushed up to see what's going on. They're excited. And Peter's first words to them are almost, you handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate. You disowned the holy and righteous one. You killed the author of life. And he piles up all these failures of the crowd in terms of their rejection of Jesus. They are guilty before God because of their mistreatment of his chosen anointed king, the awaited Christ. And yet God has raised this man to life. And so notice in the midst of him uh, saying all this to them, he's throwing out a whole number of titles for Jesus. He speaks about him as the suffering servant, verse 13. That's an allusion to Isaiah 52 and 50. The unrighteous one in verse 14. He calls him the author of life in verse 15. Later in the passage, he's going to keep going. He's going to refer to Abraham and Samuel. He's also going to refer to Moses in the section about Moses in verse 22, he says that Jesus is the great deliverer and prophet foretold by Moses. He is the one. They've missed what they're waiting for, and so they have sinned against God and are guilty before him. Now, perhaps you're thinking, well, 
is this true of the crowd that's assembled? Has, has Peter come on a bit strong here? I mean, are they all really guilty of killing Jesus? Were they all there seven weeks ago at the Passover feast when Jesus was crucified? I mean, sure, some of them probably were. This is the second of the big feasts of the year. and A lot of them would have been there and returned again. Perhaps they were in the crowd, at least some of them, shouting out, crucify him. But probably not all of them. And besides, they weren't the ones that hammered the nails in Jesus' wrist. I mean, that was the Roman soldiers, right? And, and so is Peter saying too much here in terms of laying on them their guilt of the way they treated Jesus? And if we were then in turn to think about ourselves two millennium later, you know, are we really guilty as we read this today? I mean, we weren't there 2,000 years ago to do these things to Jesus. Well, see, the truth of the matter is that the answer to the crowd and to ourselves even today is that, yes, we're complicit, we're implicated in what happened in the crucifixion of Jesus. How so? Well, it was our sin that took Jesus to the cross. The only reason that Jesus needed to die and to lay down his life in accordance with what the prophets had predicted, in accordance with God's plan even before the beginning of time, is because of our sin needing to be paid for. Jesus lay hanging on the cross because of your sin and mine. And certainly the sin of the crowd of that day too. They are guilty before God. That sense of us being complicit, even though we're some years down the track, is being taken up by various writers and singers and songwriters over the past 2,000 years. Let me give you a more modern version of it. The Irish rock band U2 expressed this really well in their song with B.B. King a few years ago, When Love Comes to Town. I don't know if you remember this song, but one of the verses said the following, I was there when they crucified my Lord. I held the scabbard when the soldier drew his sword. I threw the dice when they pierced his side. But I've seen love conquer the great divide. You see what they're saying there? I mean, Bono looks old these days, but he's not 2,000 years old. And he's saying that he may as well have been there. Like the crowd on the day, we're no different. If, in fact, if we'd been there, we would have been shouting, kill him too. You see, at some point, we have all rejected Jesus in our own way. And what Peter is doing here is really defining sin for us. You see, sin is ultimately rejection of God as ruler of our life. Rejection of his son, the Lord Jesus, whom he sent to save us. When we say we're going to rule our lives our own way, that we're going to ignore God and we're going to do things without reference to him, we're rebelling against God. And the rejection of God's right to rule over us as our creator is what the Bible says is sin. You know, the specific things that we do wrong by day by day, our proud words our selfish thoughts, our lies, our actions which hurt those around us in various ways. Yes, we call those sins too, but they are really a symptom of the root disease, our core problem of rejecting God's way. God has laid out for us how we're to live in his word and we want to go our own way. And our rejection of God is a great offense before him. God can't simply turn away and ignore it because he is a holy and just God. He has to differentiate between right and wrong. He can't just allow wrong to go through to the keeper as were, as if it doesn't matter. That would be a mark on his character if he ignored sin and didn't justly stand in condemnation of it. And so as a result, in our natural state before God, we stand condemned we stand guilty and there's nothing we can do that can actually fix that guilt. There's no way to erase it. I can't do enough good things to outweigh the bad. I can't throw off this guilt by some effort of my own. I actually need a rescuer at that point because I'm powerless to fix the problem. We're all powerless to save ourselves. 
And I know that's hard because we live in a world today that wants to tell us we can be in control, that we can make the call, that we can fix it, that it's up to us, the strength and power is within us. The truth is we're in desperate need. What does it look like to be powerless? Well, in August of 2000, uh, the Kursk, a uh, Russian state-of-the-art nuclear sub, which is about twice the length of a Boeing 747, was part of military operations off Norway. And on Saturday, August 12, during their summer exercises, something went terribly wrong. There was this initial underwater explosion followed by a much greater explosion two minutes later, which actually registered 3.5 on the Richter scale. That's equivalent of five tonnes of TNT detonating at once. It's thought likely that a torpedo um, on board the Kursk prematurely detonated through some fault or freak accident, and then the rest of the weapons went off shortly thereafter. And the result inside the Kursk would have been mayhem, absolute worst nightmare. We actually know what happened because they've managed to get that sub from the bottom of the sea. You see, that second blast ripped through the torpedo compartment at the front of it and sent water cascading through the first five sections of the sub, sending it nose first to the bottom. Despite the incredible size of that blast, such as the engineering design of these things today, that the back half of the submarine, um, those there were still alive and unaffected. Some of what happened in the aftermath of the blast is known because there was a 27-year-old submariner, Dmitry Kolesnikov, who was part of those in the back half of the sub, and he wrote down what was happening, several notes, wrote it on a bit of paper, put it in plastic, and put it in his pocket. His first statement was this, all personnel from compartments six, seven, and eight moved to the ninth. There are 23 of us here. And he listed out everybody's name and rank. And then a further two hours later, he wrote to his wife this time, I love you, don't be too upset. Say hello to your mother. Say hello to my family too. It was obvious by that point already that there was very little hope for those on board. They were feeling completely powerless to save themselves. And then there's a final note on the page further down when all hope was basically gone. Nobody can actually say when this last part was written because there's no date or timing like the first two. But his father was eventually given this note and he believes that it was written several days later under appalling conditions after all the power had gone out and the lights had been lost and the temperature would have plunged and his son realised he had not long at all. And the note reads, it's dark here to write but I will try to write by touch. Looks like there is no chance. Let's hope that at least somebody reads this. See, these men were a picture of powerlessness. Facing death, no way of saving themselves. Truly helpless, dependent on somebody acting to save them. Sadly, the Russian Navy were not able to get there in time to save those men. Do you know it's the same with us and sin? We're actually powerless to fix the problem. Our guilt is such that we can't do anything before God. There's nothing we can do to extricate ourselves from that consequence of our sin. And so we really need a rescuer. We're so desperately in need of Jesus and the solution that God offers through him. And that brings me to a second answer to this question. How does Peter call us to respond to Jesus? Well, firstly, by accepting our guilt, but then secondly, by turning in repentance. By turning in repentance to God. Notice again what is recorded from verse 17. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come to you from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Notice that before calling them to repent, uh, Peter actually says that they acted in ignorance. 
Now, his purpose in saying that is not to excuse their sin or to imply that there's no forgiveness that is necessary. No, quite the contrary from what he then appeals to them to do. What he's saying is they didn't fully appreciate what they were doing. They didn't get the weight of their guilt as they rejected Jesus. I mean, Jesus even said as much, didn't he? Hanging on the cross, he prayed for them and said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And so he acknowledges that they didn't appreciate the full horror of what unfolded seven weeks earlier. But like in his Acts 2 sermon, notice that Peter states that Christ's suffering was not by chance. It wasn't like things were out of control. It was actually in fulfillment of God's prophecy, that God had planned this. And so it's neither their ignorance nor the suffering of Jesus being God's plan actually meant that sin could be set aside or ignored. And so Peter calls those in the crowd to repent. He calls them to repent and turn back to God so that their sins could be wiped away. It's a wonderful offer here. Repentance is a word that means a change of mind. It means an about face in the context of our sin. It means to acknowledge that we were going the wrong way, rejecting God, and to turn back and to go his way. And so the language of turning away is an admittance of our sin, of our wrongdoing. It's a 180 degree turn. In November of 2000, uh, Christine and I travelled into Sydney CBD on what was initially a Sunday afternoon. Um, we were going to climb the Harbour Bridge. And by the time we got into Bridge Climb for our late afternoon assault, uh, the sky was becoming a bit ominously dark. And there was obviously that sort of thunderstorm afternoon threatening. But our bridge climb leader assured us, you know, that would be no problem, that we would go ahead and we were soon in the middle of what they called a thorough briefing. If you've done it, you'll realise you get 45 minutes of being dressed up in all the gear, including rain jackets, uh, the clips to go on, and then you're practising going up over little metal steps that are supposed to mimic the bridge that you're about to climb. But as we're doing all this for 45 minutes, we see rain starting to pour lightly to begin with. But by the time we're finally heading out, it's absolutely bucketing down. We're thinking, surely they'll pull out. Like, you know, we're not going to see anything like the 360-degree breathtaking views that they've promised us. But no, our intrepid leader promised us we'd still go on. We'd been fitted with rain jackets after all. It's all good. And so we're walking out. In the first section, you're walking under the undercarriage of where the cars go before you then climb up the ladders above the roadway. And as we're walking along that first part, suddenly fork lightning starts falling on the harbour. And, and we're moving from disappointment about what we'll see to, you know, fear of death. And um, we're sort of looking at my joggers thinking, have I got enough rubber to take, you know, a direct lightning strike on a steel bridge? It, it seems unlikely. And, and so we're thinking, come on, they've, they've got to give up on this. And... No, 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 we're passing on and we're climbing up the steps up through the roadway at the last possible point where they could pull out. And finally the leader says, no, we're, we've got the word back in HQ and we're going back. But finally, to our relief. Now, there is an example of repentance. They admitted that they were wrong. They turned around and they led us back as we cheered them on. Finally, you've made the right decision. A complete change of mind. An about face. Well, thinking more seriously about this issue of sin, though, what about you? I mean, have you repented of your sin before God? Have you placed your trust in Jesus, the one payment that deals with your debt before God and wins you forgiveness? Have you traded facing God's judgment and the eternal separation from him that will come with continuing to go your own way, have you traded that for accepting the eternal life that he promises for those that trust in his son? And see, if you turn back to God, he will immediately welcome you back. I think sometimes we feel like, you know, because of who we are or the things that have happened in our life, that it's not like that he's not going to receive us. But the Bible promises over and over and over God's heart is far bigger than ours. We may be a great sinner, but we have a much greater saviour. 
And if you turn back to God, the burden of your sin will be lifted from your shoulders. We're told by Peter here that we'll be refreshed in our spirit. What is it that brings pleasure to the heart of God? What makes him smile, as it were? What is it that rings all the bells in heaven? Well, Jesus himself gives us the answer in Luke 15. He put it this way. There is rejoicing in the presence of all the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Just one. In that same chapter in Luke 15, Jesus portrays God as the joyful father running out to welcome back the prodigal son who was dead to him but is now alive. And then he kills the fattened calf. He orders a celebration because he has received back his lost son. And he includes him and welcomes him back into the family. And that is a picture of the feast of heaven, which we're told about, which every believer will enjoy one day following Christ's return. That we might be included and adopted in God's family and be part of his wonderful celebration with all those that have trusted in Jesus. Well, look, I don't know where you stand tonight, but I'm sure there'll be some here who aren't sure what they think about Jesus just yet perhaps haven't turned back in repentance to God, let me urge you to talk to somebody about that tonight. That is such an important step. It's such an important thing to consider. Please talk with someone before you leave if God is working in your heart tonight to think about that very question. That brings me to a third and final answer of how we should respond to Jesus from this passage. Finally, we need to respond to Jesus by listening to him, by listening to his teaching. Notice where Peter goes as he calls the crowd next in verses 21 to 23 to further respond. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. See, in verses 22 and 23 here, Peter is quoting from Deuteronomy 18 and Leviticus 23. It's a mashup. He's combining a couple of parts of verses to put together this statement. And Peter's making it clear that there's a promise here through Moses that there will be one like him, a great deliverer, an even greater deliverer, a prophet like Moses, but one to be longed for in the future. And when this one comes, then they must be listened to. The concept of listening to the promised prophet and deliverer comes from the book of Deuteronomy. But those consequences of being cut off if we reject that one is what Leviticus 23 brings to that quote. Failure to listen to Jesus and obey his word leads to destruction, we're told, because it's ultimately a rejection of the one who's offering payment for you. You see, the context of Leviticus 23 is the day of atonement, the payment for sin. And the one who will come and fully deal with your sin and mine is Jesus through his death on the cross. And so if we don't listen to him, if we reject that payment, then there is nothing left for us to be able to stand before God. Instead of Jesus taking God's punishment on our behalf, we will stand before God and we will have to take it in and of ourselves. And so we must heed Christ's word. And as we apply this final point to ourselves tonight we need to realize that it's not only heeding christ's words at the point of salvation but this is an ongoing requirement for all those who do trust in jesus that christ's words to us in the bible are imperative for us to listen to they're not just take it or leave it you know i've got my ticket to heaven now because i've trusted in jesus but i don't really need to bother about following all this stuff that he commands But you don't receive Jesus as Saviour without receiving him also as Lord. And so he calls us to live for him, to be truly followers of him every moment. And so often we play down his word, don't we? We play down our inattention to what he has taught us. 
we excuse our laziness. We sort of make little of the lack of seriousness in our life about heeding what he tells us to do. And we think to ourselves, oh, well, you know, I'm just struggling with reading the Bible at the moment, but it doesn't matter. I haven't got around to it for the last month, but, you know, I'll listen to a podcast next week and that'll give me a little bit of input or something like that. And as we say those kind of things, we don't see ourselves as ignoring Jesus. We don't see ourselves as failing to listen to him. And yet the New Testament is full of warnings towards God people, to God's people, that we are not to think such ways, that we are to take really serious what Jesus instructs us to do in his word. Let me just look at one example with you as we conclude in James 1, verses 22 to 24. This is the brother of Jesus writing who understood this point very clearly. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. I mean, verse 22, it's the Nike verse of the New Testament. Just do it. Don't simply go to church or go to Bible study or hear the Bible read or taught somewhere else. Live it out. Do it. It's not enough to just know lots about Jesus. We're actually called to count the cost, to take up our cross, to follow him each day. Because we all know the danger of hearing but not actually obeying. It brings out that horrible, terrifying word that we don't like being thrown at us, of hypocrite, somebody who seems to know it all but doesn't actually practice what they preach, who has all the theory but doesn't actually live it out. James says it's actually worse than that. We're actually deceiving ourselves if we believe that such a pattern is okay. We're self-deluded if we've convinced ourselves that knowledge is an end in itself. And it's often said in our world today that knowledge equals power. I want to put it to you tonight that the Bible tells you knowledge equals responsibility. If you know something and you don't do it, then God will hold you to account about that. And so we need to take God's word seriously. We need to heed Christ's words to us. I was so conscious at the end of Bible college that all these great things I was learning was far outstripping my ability to actually live it. And so I was terrified by the end of college thinking I, it's going to take me a long time to catch up to what I now know that I should do. It'd be better if I didn't have this knowledge. <laughs> I was so aware of my inadequacy. So we need to apply ourselves to Christ's word. We need to have a holy dissatisfaction with any half-baked attitudes about his word to us. It is life. It is how we are to live moment by moment. And it's not just about our personal walk with the Lord, as if that's all that matters. We've actually got a great responsibility to spur one another on. Let me show you. Hebrews 3, verses 12 to 14. The writer to the Hebrews says this, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. So let me ask you, firstly, how are you going at responding to Jesus' word to you, heeding his instruction day by day? But then secondly, and just as importantly, how are you going at spurring on your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you take that responsibility seriously? It applies in your own family, yes, but it applies beyond in your church family gathered here tonight. There's no room for complacency when it comes to God's word. Not just as an individual, but as a church community. It's just so important. So I want to encourage you as we finish. 
think about one thing that you could do this week to help you grow in your commitment to heeding Christ's word to you. To firstly reading it so that you might hear it, but determination to live it and respond to it. And then think of one thing, is your second thing, of how you might spur even one brother or sister in Christ this week. To see to it that they're walking strongly with the Lord because their walk with the Lord is as important to you as yours is. Let's be about those who simply cannot turn away from Christ's word, but want to hear it and live it and encourage all around us to do the same. Let me pray for us to that end. Our Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that as Peter spoke some 2,000 years ago, that he laid down heavily the guilt of the crowd for their failure to accept Jesus, for actually killing the author of life. Indeed, even though that was your plan from before the beginning of this world, yet it doesn't absolve their rejection or ours today, two millennium later, if we've set him aside, whether in our ignorance or not, that we've rejected him and just gone our own way, living as if we're the rightful ruler when you placed him clearly over us. Lord, we pray that you might help us to grasp clearly our guilt and therefore our need to repent. We thank you that in your great love for us, you sent Jesus not to condemn the world, but to offer salvation to those who might hear your wonderful offer of grace, your undeserved favour to us through Jesus, that we might turn back to you through faith in him and receive forgiveness for our sin and our rejection of you. Lord, I pray for anyone tonight who is yet to take that step, that you might be at work in their heart, helping them, them to see their powerlessness before you, their need of a wonderful saviour in the Lord Jesus. And Lord, for those of us who have accepted him, who have turned back in repentance and faith, Lord, help us to see our ongoing need to respond to him as Lord of our life. Help us not to be okay with a flippant approach where we ignore what he has to say, where we effectively run around as if we're still Lord of our life, ignoring him. Lord, help us to be horrified at such an outlook. Help us be determined with your help, the help of your spirit, to heed your word, to respond to it as you enable us. Strengthen us, we pray, to live for you and not for ourselves. We ask this in Christ's name. Friends, this next song we're going to...